Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Game Changer. I'm Mariam Zia. When we talk about any country's economy, of course, a strong economy is very important for the revival of or survival of any country. And in this current economic or global environment that we are living in and that we are witnessing, a strong economy is very important. And for this purpose, uh, the government recently announced an economic revival plan. And this is a long-term plan, uh, and the purpose is to attract more uh, foreign direct investments to the country. And there are certain fields that are highlighted in this uh, program that will be, we will be talking about in today's program. Uh, when we talk about the implementation of this economic uh, revival plan, of course, uh, there is a special investment facilitation council uh, that has been created uh, for the purpose of this economic revival plan and different uh, implementation uh, uh, strategies uh, will be uh, uh, considered in this program. In today's program, we will be talking about these strategies and layout of this economic revival program. And if this program uh, is implemented and this plan and project is implemented in its true spirit, by 2035, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, there is a potential that Pakistan could become a trillion dollar economy. And this is considered to be bigger than a CPAC, and uh, this could be a game changer for Pakistan. Uh, in today's program, we will be talking about the challenges that could arise uh, as a result of this economic revival plan <coughs> and how to uh, address those challenges, uh, what is going to be uh, the layout and the strategies that lie ahead. Uh, to discuss this and more, we are joined in the program by Mr. Hanan Hussain, uh, who is expert in international affairs. Welcome to the program. We are also joined by Brigadier Retired Hamid Rashid, uh, who is senior analyst. Welcome to the program. Thank you. We are joined online by Mr. Humayu Khan, who is senior analyst and expert in international affairs. Welcome to the program. Uh, Mr. Hanan, uh, let me start with you with a very basic question. What is uh, the purpose of this economic revival plan and what are some of the key objectives uh, that, are, uh, that you, uh, you could see uh, could be helpful in the current economic situation of the country? Well, the purpose is pretty simple. Uh, you would want uh, a single door, a single window into uh, kind of advancing investments uh, for mm -hmm. Pakistan. Uh, I think uh, the link drawn with GCC countries, like-minded economies, is a substantial one because uh, the intent has been there, uh, but the effort to streamline that based on uh, a good civilian and military nexus on investment has been largely um, downplayed, but now is being revived in full spirit. So I think in that regard, it gives the outside investors a very clear signal about uh, which windows and which areas they need to go through in order to advance things going forward. I think in terms of Pakistan's national significance, look, there are many, many merits. For example, uh, we see that this particular project, if implemented, as you pointed out, could lead to a trillion dollar vision. And on, on the back of that, in the next four to five years, we see long-term planning kind of taking root, uh, direct jobs, for example, to 10 to 20 million. And of course, indirect jobs could go up over 75 million as well. That's important for Pakistan of because course. we need different sectors to be activated uh, in sync. Mm. And the fact that, for example, even if you look at the telecommunications sector, it has been supplying billions to the national exchequer. You look at the IT, there's been a lot of untapped growth, uh, agriculture as well. And I think so from that point of view, the desire to eliminate red tape, give investors a clear mm. signal about where they need to go, and also use this to uh, advance an export-oriented model is something that Pakistan has long awaited for and hence is exciting and realistic in equal measure. Of course. Uh, Sab, what are some of the key uh, strategies uh, that would be implemented for this economic revival plan, uh, in your opinion? Uh, my friend has also highlighted that there are two basic segments in which uh, basically the Special Investment Facilitation Council is working at. First is the layout of policies and strategies that are going to help the investors. As we have seen that the Gulf countries, they are showing interest in investment in Pakistan, they don't want red typeism to become a hurdle in their investment. So in that way, I think uh, this special council is going to chalk out the policies which are going to help the investors. They are going to give them the ease of business through one window operation. And I think the other thing uh, which they also need is that a long term policy making by the government, okay. which we are also listening a lot about the charter of economy like the Charter of Democracy, I think that is the need of the hour, mm -hmm. that all our uh, leadership, they sit down, and I think the Chief of Army Staff, General Asim Manir, has taken a very right step at a right time, in a right direction, okay. that he has given a vision to the political leadership that how they are going to go for the revival of economy. Of course. And, and if these two things are done by the government, 
in true Lateran spirit, I think it is going to go a long way for Pakistan. Of course, uh, there is a long way for Pakistan when we talk about this economic revival plan. Uh, Mr. Humayu, uh, for the implementation of this economic uh, revival plan, a special investment uh, facilitation council has also been created and launched. Uh, how do you view the key objectives uh, and uh, the composition of this special investment facilitation council? I guess I would agree with the two distinguished panelists before we were talking about. Uh, Pakistan currently is facing one of the direst uh, consequences in our history. We have just been hit by the biblical floods, which have never been in the past. So the economy, and then we are also uh, almost coming out of the three or four years COVID uh, crisis. So all these things together and the political instability, which was created for last couple of months by opposition party, combined uh, created a very, very uh, negative situation for Pakistan. In that context, government of Pakistan was talking with IMF, and then there was another plan which was called Plan B in case the IMF uh, uh, deal doesn't go through as we expected, we should have an alternative. And this alternative is the Specialist Investment Facilitation Council, whose EPEX committee had the army chief in it, all uh, uh, chief ministers, finance ministers of different provinces, uh, finance ministers, federal finance minister, and other important uh, ministries are involved in it. In that context, uh, there are like five key areas which this council has identified, which is IT sector, energy, uh, agriculture, mines and minerals, livestock. These are the areas which and Pakistan has a huge well. potential. Hmm. So we needed to tap foreign direct investment, increase our import, uh, and then overcome this economic crisis. So in that particular context, this plan B, which eventually will become plan A, by the way, because this is something which was needed for a very long time, and this current government has taken a very, very uh, strong step. And then including the uh, military leadership in it also gives a very strong signal that, you know, both the civilian and military leadership on the same time, security has been an issue for foreign direct investment. So once uh, army is also part of this, that also gives a lot of confidence to the foreign investors that security will be guaranteed. Same is the case with uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which, is, which will also become part of this uh, initiative as well in a way. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily directly, but once you have all these infrastructure laid out, in foreign direct investment is coming quickly. So these all things are going to gel together. And if you remember, security was one of the prime concerns of the Chinese of investor course. here. But then when military uh, stepped in and they created a special uh, uh, security division, the mm. apprehensions were uh, like sort of laid down. So in mm. this context, this is a very important composition that all the civil and military leadership are together. And once they are there and they're on the same page, I guess the economic revival is uh, very imminent. So this co uh, collaboration of civil and military is, of course, very significant when we talk about this economic revival plan. Uh, what are some of the key sectors, like you pointed, some of the sectors as well, in which uh, both uh, civil and military are going to be collaborating for implementation of this uh, plan? Yes, this, this collaboration is going to be on the pattern of National Command and Operation Center, which was basically established for the elimination of corona. Okay. So the entire uh, administrative machinery of civil and military bureaucracy and establishment were together in order to fight uh, the corona pandemic. This is the same crisis that we are now facing, which is sort of an existential threat for us, the economic crisis. Because it's not only in Pakistan, the entire global south is suffering. There is uh, supply chain disruption, which has happened because of the uh, Russian and Ukraine war. Uh, COVID pandemic basically throughout the world has also disrupted a lot of these supply chains. Inflation is very high throughout the world. So once uh, this uh, special uh, council, investment council is uh, working uh, coherently with each other, so I guess there, there's, there's going to be a couple of things. There are already, as Hanan was earlier mentioning, there are a lot of bottlenecks which needs to be removed. That is something which we need to do. Like This is going to be a one-window operation. Since after the 18th Amendment, we are like a, a federation and provinces has a lot of uh, their own uh, resources and their own strategies. The idea of making this one-window operation was that all these resources are channeled through one uh, council, and whenever there is a bottleneck, that should be removed. So in terms of IT, in terms of uh, mining, in terms of, you know, uh, Balochistan has huge resources in terms of mines and minerals. And there is a security issue there. 
So once military and civil bureaucracy are together and the security is provided by military, the foreign direct investment would be coming very easily. Gawada port is already in terms of uh, progressing uh, very quickly and that too thanks to the uh, military uh, providing a lot of security there. So once these infrastructure are laid down, the foreign direct investment will be coming very quickly and Pakistan would be on a trajectory which we have not seen before. Of course. Uh, Mr. Hanan, when we talk about, of course, uh, this Special Investment Facilitation Council, how significant is uh, this council in your opinion? And also how government is going to make uh, sure that all the province, uh, provinces and as well as the other key stakeholders are on board when we talk about seamless uh, implementation of this plan? So let's take them one by one. When we talk about the significance, I think it is um, pretty clear the fact that Pakistan, the time has come for Pakistan mm. to advance on a trajectory mm. which is not basically driven by short-term comforts about mm. revenue or FDI coming in. We see a very strong and very clear signal coming from the Prime Minister himself who said that the initial goal mm. is to drive a foreign direct investment to $5 billion. So I think on one level it is mm. also to uh, kind mm. of establish a practice. Mm. That Significant significance in terms of the composition of this uh, special investment uh, facilitation council? Yeah, absolutely, because based on those mm. targets, we do see uh, greater cohesion uh, structurally mm. between uh, you know, the federal and provincial ministries, also representation from the armed forces, um, you know, their experience with kind of consolidating uh, you know, different parts of the bureaucracy based on a common mission, and we saw COVID as a success story on that front. So I think with the various civilian and military uh, stakeholders involved, the structurally significant, but the fact that you want to drive up investment and have those trickle-down effects come down to the provinces uh, tells you a lot about, for example, what Pakistan's needs to advance its manufacturing industry as well, which will then become the backbone for export-oriented stuff. So it's a long-term process. I think on one level it's important because Pakistan has to develop the habit of kind of planning long-term. And I think the fact that you have four to five-year targets, you have a 2035 target, tells you a bit about where mm. we're headed on that front. Now, when you talk about, for example, how uh, you know Pakistan is willing to advance this and go forward, I think from the GCC countries, look, the intent has been there on many of these sectors. You look towards the energy sector. Just recently, we saw within this month, the petroleum minister said that Saudi Arabia and Pakistan uh, were on the verge of kind of finalizing a long sought oil refinery project. Now, many of those things haven't happened in the past because of feasibility concerns. And the fact that this particular initiative focuses on streamlining those concerns mm -hmm. Uh, sends one signal to the investor that, you know, uh, when they invest, what are the kind of, you know, contours of that investment are they looking at? What sectors do they prefer? And in turn, I think it also gives a, a very strong voice to Pakistan's critical sectors, such as the agriculture. For example, what are their stakes in advancing Pakistan's economy and how does that align with investor sentiment? So I think greater connection through a single window operation is something that many success stories from Saudi Arabia to Qatar have looked at. Pakistan mm. may be late to join the road, but it has done so, mm. and doing so would uh, kind of advance Pakistan's mm. priorities. So can you tell us some? Uh, can you tell us about some of the success stories? And there are some. Do you see some lessons that Pakistan can learn from those uh, success sto stories when we talk about uh, this uh, single window operation for multiple uh, sources and domains uh, to come together for this economic revival plan? Absolutely. So I'll give you one example from Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's a huge example, mm -hmm. of course, but structurally we can learn a lot. When you talk about their uh, public investment fund, uh, it's a single window operation. It is looked at managing strategic investments. So what do you mean by strategic? Investments that Saudi Arabia is able to place in its sectors and then kind of match Saudi Arabia's own domestic needs with investor sentiment. So single window operations worked greatly for Saudi Arabia. The wealth fund has grown. And now for Pakistan to kind of learn from that experience, look, we've been engaging with the Saudis for a long time. They're time-tested partners. Partners, but when they engaged with Pakistan, there was this expectation that Pakistan can send a much stronger signal on investments, on business environments, and that can be done through a single window operation. Similarly, we see wealth funds in the UAE. Qatar is also structured differently. But the fact is, look, Mariam, these funds and these single window operations need to endure long term. Of course. And the fact that the Prime Minister has spelled out and the Army Chief has kind of advanced and uh, endorsed targets that stretch multi-year is good news for Pakistan's mm. investments, is good news for Pakistan's mm. sectors, and will be a test case for how we kind of uh, break through bureaucratic concerns. Of course, because co consistency is very important when we talk about economic uh, plans, any economic plan. Uh, and talking about these plans, uh, Brigadier Hamid, uh, what do you think, what are the steps that would be needed uh, to address any uh, any inter-provincial or inter-institutional or inter-departmental concerns or conflicts that may arise when we talk about implementation of this project? 
I think this is a very important question mm. and important aspect which has been addressed this time. Because if we talk of single window operation or we talk of revival of economy, mm. it has been done in the past by the different governments. Of course. What was lacking was this aspect. Mm. Who is going to synchronize? Who is going to harmonize the efforts? Mm. Because there are different ministries with and different aims and in different directions. Mm. Conflict of interest. Yes. Mm. And conflict of interest also, but different directions. Of Everybody course. is working hard, but in different directions. Mm. But this time, with the initiative taken by the army, uh, we talk of NCOC for Corona, but we also should remember the efforts of Pakistan army, putting Pakistan out of the gray list in FATF issue also. Mm. It was actually the Pakistan army which provided the harmony, which provided the synergy to different ministries to overcome the observation. And this time also, Pakistan army will be in the forefront to provide that synergy. As you talk that different provinces and different ministries, the army will be actually coordinating their efforts mm -hmm. in the unilateral direction. That is what five sector has been already selected. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, because we all know that Pakistan is an agriculture country, but because of the primitive and orthodox cultivation techniques being used mm -hmm. by farmers, we are not mm -hmm. able to have food security. Mm -hmm. And we Outdated always spend a lot of, of our financial mm -hmm. sector importing the food stuff. So in that way, uh, diff agriculture and second is IT, mm -hmm. as already talked by Hana. It is unbridled and we have a lot of potential in this sector and as well as telecommunication also. Mm. When there will be synergy, when there will be a monitoring system also mm. put in so place. So how these uh, uh, policies would be aligned when we talk about uh, provincial governments as well as the federal governments and uh, the coordination of different ministries. How do you think uh, that there are some basic hurdles uh, that would be needed to remove yeah. for successful presently, implementation? Uh, presently we see that is there any business to be set up in Pakistan, investment mm. is to be done. There are a lot of departments which are involved, federal mm. as well as provincial. Army setting up a national command center under the Special Investment Facilitation Council because we see there are three different committees, Apex Committee, then the Executive, Executive Committee and Committee. Implementation okay. Committee. These three tiers will be there to address the problems of the investors in a, I think, very organized and pragmatic manner which was missing previously. And secondly, the aspect is the coordination by the army. As we see that uh, the Gulf countries have very strong bond with the Pakistan army because of the training facilities we provide to the mm. Gulf countries and they also have a lot of trust and confidence on Pakistan army. When Pakistan army is coming in uh, conjunction with the federal government and with the provincial governments, I think uh, the policies are going to set the stage for the provinces as well as for the federal government to move in a right direction and in unilateral direction. So I think if there are certain problems which can be addressed either in the executive committee or in the apex committee, if there are certain concerns because mm. after the 18th amendment, there is certain autonomy of which course. has been given to the provinces. Mm. That has also been safeguarded and respected. But I think because of the apex committee and because of the executive con committee in the this council, these uh, issues if they are will be discussed and will be solution suggested accordingly and I think this is the synergy which was required and it has been actually addressed by the government. Of course. Uh, Mr. Mayu, when we talk about this economic revival plan, of course, uh, there are five key sectors and other sectors that, as well uh, that have been pointed out, uh, which uh, holds uh, untapped potential uh, for Pakistan's economy. But agricultural sector is one of the key sectors. Let's talk about agriculture sectors. What are some of the key initiatives that, in your opinion, are needed uh, in agriculture sector when we talk about Pakistan's economic revival? For answering that, I'll just give you some some good news which just recently happened once we announced this, which was somehow related to this uh, economic uh, revival plan as well. The UAE government and part of UAE government was Abu Dhabi Group, uh, which basically ADB ports, uh, one of the largest groups in Abu Dhabi. They, they promised to invest in uh, Karachi port uh, around $2 billion uh, worth of dollars in the next couple of uh, years. That was also a very, very positive statement for Pakistan. Uh, apart from that, China, Pakistan have uh, recently, just recently signed another uh, agreement to set up the fifth uh, unit of uh, Cheshma uh, nuclear power plant for the uh, energy requirement of Pakistan. So these two are also very important. And then the Saudi government 
has also promised to invest more in the coming days, not necessarily uh, in one sector, but there are multiple sectors in which discussion is going on. Coming back to the agriculture sector, this is basically an agrarian economy, and almost 70% of our uh, economy is dependent on this. In this way, this, this, there are multiple things which are now needed. And perhaps this uh, investment which we are seeking from outside countries, particularly European Union and, and many other countries as well, is going to be on the greener aspect where we have to look after the climate mitigation activities, where we'll have to increase the productivity and we also have to do uh, in a way that Pakistan is also becoming a water scarce country as well. So we need new technologies which are going to be implemented where water resources are managed in a way that we don't do this flood irrigation, which we used to do. We need to modernize our agriculture. We need to increase the yield of our crops. And then we also need to diversify uh, different markets, which are basically the neighboring countries where we could export this agriculture product. So these are many areas in which Pakistan can work. And this particular Economic Revival Council is going to help uh, secure the foreign direct investment in these projects. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Humayu Khan, for being with us in today's program. Uh, we are talking about Pakistan's economic revival plan, and there are uh, five key sectors that are being discussed in this program, that is agriculture, IT, telecommunication, energy, as well as defense production. We will be talking more about it, but after a short break. program. Uh, we are also joined in the program by Dr. Hasnain Javed, who is economist and senior analyst. Welcome to the program. Um, so, uh, Mr. Hanan, uh, let me uh, continue the discussion. Uh, when we talk about different sectors, of course, IT and telecommunication are other key sectors uh, in which uh, there is a lot of potential uh, for economic activities. Uh, how do you think that uh, this economic uh, revival plan is going uh, to fill those gaps that exist in these sectors when we talk about uh, Pakistan's economy? Well, I think first of all, it's going to build on the strengths of those existing sectors. So, for example, the telecommunications sector just recently supplied several hundred billions to Pakistan's national exchequer. Uh, and I think the fact that it did that without an economic re recovery plan as such tells you a lot about uh, the resilience that that sector has shown. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of ways of facilitating, look, I think this single window operation is going to play a key role in kind of connecting uh, Pakistan's uh, domestic telecommunication market uh, with its partners overseas. I think we've uh, seen many uh, commercial partnerships in the past about telecommunication also happening, uh, be it private, be it government. But this particular window is unique in the sense that it allows those public and private partnerships to be built under one window. So on the one end, you have government targets for increasing investments mm -hmm. and getting business environments across. At the other end, you also have Pakistan's domestic industry and their representation being channeled through this. So I think the fact that you can develop long-lasting connections between two helps a lot. Secondly, on IT, I think Pakistan's um, ability and Pakistan's potential uh, to transform itself digitally is something that is in line with regional expectations. We see a lot of that happening in China, we see a lot of that happening in the Middle East. Uh, this particular plan is unique in the sense that it takes those sectors into account and obviously the strong points behind that growth and so, how they so can be what, tied in. what steps are uh, needed or would be done uh, by this uh, Special Investment Facilitation Council when we talk about uh, digital infrastructure and digital divide in the country for that matter? What needs to be done? So uh, it, it helps to, to understand and recognize <coughs> that uh, the digital advancements are going to be secondary given Pakistan's concerns about agriculture mm -hmm. and all that. But in terms of making it happen, two things. First of all, uh, this particular single window can play a key role in convening uh, industrial experts and industrial representatives from Pakistan size and connecting them across. So I think as a marketplace that links both sectors and represent, uh, representatives together is important because that happens. I mean, if you look back to, for example, uh, Prime Minister's highly successful visit to Turkey, and there was a lot of focus on using this visit to set up and inspire individual B2B linkages. So okay. that happening in IT and telecommunication is huge because Saudi Arabia is also pulling in a lot of investment from China to make it happen. The idea is to get Pakistan part of that conversation. And for that to happen, Pakistan's economic recovery plan through this single window 
uh, operation will play a key role in kind of connecting motivation and then let businesses handle those things up front. Of so course. government coming forward. Of yeah. course. Uh, Dr. Sen, uh, we're talking about different sectors that are highlighted and pointed out uh, that holds untapped potential for revival of Pakistan's economy. And of course, energy sector is crucial when we uh, talk about Pakistan's economy. Uh, how do you think that government uh, uh, needs, uh, what are the strategies that are needed by the government uh, to tackle or address uh, the current uh, energy crisis? See, uh, actually, when we talk about the Special Investment Facilitation Council, it is the broader way, it is moreover, it is not just about the specific areas, whether it is the energy, whether it is uh, the uh, uh, FMCG, whether it is the foreign direct investment in the power sector, and energy sector, or other sector. You have seen that it's a complete stagnancy overall in the departments. I mean, we cannot improve the IPP sector, we cannot... Uh, compete with the energy sector. We cannot have the coal power projects. We cannot have the uh, green power projects. We are uh, still lacking the two percent of the total uh, alternative energy program. So these all energy power projects. If we talk about then the target is to achieve this SIFC uh, uh, plan is about the hundred billion in FDI within the three years, and the total is uh, about the one trillion GDP level of two, 2035. But I just wanted to talk before I talk about the energy sector specifically. But uh, most important part, as I always say, and uh, uh, I mean stressing this point, that our, we have a bureaucratic problem. Our bureaucracy is completely, completely redundant. Redundant. Uh, as far as the uh, other countries are concerned, we are not dealing with the central Asian state where the power hub can be. Where we are not dealing with the, uh, uh, China in a better way as we have to. That's why army must have to intervene in that way that the, where the obstacles comes in. So we have seen the uh, I mean complete obstacle and we have no objection certificate uh, that often take about the 18th month. N n none of the single company can uh, come and operate. You know that I always talk about uh, duplication of the so, provincial so and federal said, government, duplication of... Yeah. What steps are needed uh, when we talk about these bureaucratic hurdles and removing uh, these barriers and bottlenecks uh, for creating a conducive environment for investments, uh, both uh, from within the country and foreign direct investments as well? Yeah, this is very much relevant question. Uh, see, this is the very important thing what we need to understand why SIFC is there. So first, first come first is the frame, uh, frame the economic policies that ensures the predictability, continuity and effective implementation to revive the economy. Because we have 3.8 of the reserves, we are not dealing with any of the industry. So what are the problems? So SIFC serve a single window for the multi-domain uh, domain cooperation in the relevant field. And second, this will remove the obstacle of the 90 government NOCs. So 90 government of uh, NOCs mean no objection certificate that o often take over 18 months of the process licensing. And then SIFC uh, will aim to facilitate the investment and create the enabling policy environment. So as you talk about the hurdles, I'm uh, now specifically uh, pointing out the f uh, problems and hurdles. So improving the ease of doing business and overcoming the systematic bureaucratic hurdles, one. Second is optimizing the horizontal vertical synergies because we have a complete horizontal vertical glitches all over the bureaucracy so that even if, if the China wants some cherries, if, if they want some chilies, they, we cannot send on a proper import-export licensing based, uh, I mean, import system. So then is to coordinate the, between the federal and provincial level because uh, try to understand that if there is a board of investment in federal, there is a board, in, a board of investment of Punjab is different, KPK is different, Balochistan is different. What is happening all, all, all over the projects? So duplication must have to tackle down. Now, then is the avoiding the duplication of the effort, as I'm told, telling you the federal and the provincial level, we have to eliminate all those problems. And this SIF said, I really appreciate Pakistan military to intervene in this area. Otherwise, because uh, they are quite, bureaucracy is quite reluctant uh, to hire the meritocrat, uh, on the basis of meritocratic, uh, uh, I mean, structure. They don't want to have the technocratic people. Well, 
expenditure and investment and the project implementation. See, if somebody wanted to come in the uh, home country to host country, we have to give the, we have 6,500 plus multinational companies. We have to deal with them. And so there must be the facilitation plan as the, uh, under the CPAC, there were the 70,000 companies on the, uh, on just on the uranium and they are making the power projects. So uh, uh, your uh, point is very particular. We have to uh, uh, pick up the 100 megawatt of the small projects, 50 megawatt of the uh, small projects we have to develop in that area. So particularly with bureaucratic glitches all over the Pakistan, we cannot expand this 100 billion of the target uh, under the SIFC. So the, the most important part is the, uh, which I always pointing out is the reducing red tapism, which is uh, no doubt it, it is completely in our bureaucratic structure. We have to reduce it down and then is implementing the investor friendly policies. Policies are completely minus as of Ministry of Industries, uh, Foreign Ministries, um, uh, Ministry of Commerce, Board of Investment. They must have to work under the one window operation. And then I okay. always talk about uh, those particular issues. So. So SIFC okay, will play the pivotal role in enhancing the awareness window of the Pakistan. operations are going to be used for implementation of different projects when we talk about this economic revival plan. Uh, uh, Brigadier Hamid, uh, when we talk about uh, different sectors that have been pointed out, of course, all the sectors of Pakistan's economy have the potential uh, uh, to uh, for investment and uh, for, of course, uh, the uh, hurdles and bottlenecks to be removed. But when we talk about defense production, of course, that was also pointed out in, in this economic revival plan. How do you see... Uh, this uh, particular sector holds potential for uh, reviving Pakistan's economy. I think uh, this should be discussed also because mm. there are certain no-go areas and I think Pakistan, mm, this was also taken as a no-go area. But I think this is the right initiative now by taken by the Chief of Army Staff, mm. General Sayyid Asamani, because we ex import a lot of defense equipment and weapons which uh, basically results in depleting our foreign reserves. And we have a lot of potential also for export. Let me also apprise you, we have more than two dozen public sector entities which are producing from aircraft, tanks, to night vision devices also. And similarly, we have in um, private sector also more than 50 medium to small establishments which are also producing defense-related gadgets and equipment like small uh, drones, etc. And I think uh, we have also a market available to us mm. in shape of Gulf countries and also going up to Africa. And if we see also future prospects, we can also uh, highlight South America market also. And Pakistan has a lot of expertise also as far as the defense production is concerned. We have established defense production ministry, but it is not that vibrant as such. Mm. We have also uh, put in place ideas at Karachi. Of course. This is a good uh, actually mm. showcase our expertise in the defense related weapon equipment. And this is a sector which is, I think, uh, underrated as such because of the expertise also, because of uh, production facilities also. Hmm. But there's a lot of potential when we talk about Pakistan's yes, defense production. This is what course. I am saying. We are producing JF-17, we are hmm. producing al Khalid tank also, we are producing different weapons, we are producing night vision devices, hmm. which are of, of uh, global standard. And in the global market also, there is a lot of uh, demand of uh, defense related equipment there and in world overall. because. Self-defense is a right of every country, every citizen. Mm -hmm. We are not saying that there should be proliferation of weapons and equipment, but at the same time, the justified and bona fide export is, I think, a legal process which should be pursued as such. And I think if we give certain initiative and certain uh, policy framework for the private investment coming in, and there can be public-private uh, partnership also, and joint ventures also, and I think there is a lot of scope and which should be, I think, exploited by the now constituted Special Investment Facilitation, facilitation Council. Council. Of course. Uh, Mr. Hannan, uh, when we talk about dif dif different sectors, like we earlier discussed about, energy sector uh, remains very significant and crucial, uh, keeping in mind Pakistan's energy needs. So are there some plans to promote renewable energy resources to mitigate the climate change crisis that we witness in Pakistan? So uh, if you take a close look at Pakistan's climate advocacy, it has featured a mix of a lot of things. First of that was to highlight Pakistan's efforts to reduce its carbon footprint. And also with 
regard to Pakistan having um, you know a bigger seat at the table when it comes to kind of reducing emissions, attracting technologies, getting support and financing. I think the biggest constraint, one of the biggest constraints over there was to have adequate financing so we could deliver on those goals. I mean, uh, without having that kind of financial, I'd say, leverage for you. Uh, all of these targets will be difficult to achieve because, as it was pointed out earlier, Pakistan has suffered uh, adversely from catastrophic floods, and there is greater likelihood that we may face similar events in the future. Mm -hmm. So, with Pakistan's economy taking so, a how important is uh, to address the renewable re energy resources? Well, it is important, but uh, I think the financing part of it becomes really huge, and that's where this plan comes mm -hmm. in because uh, the fact is that when you increase Pakistan's domestic competencies and the fact that, uh, for example, uh, uh, UAE is on the verge of of ho uh, hosting uh, uh, this year's biggest climate event. Uh, so the fact that <coughs> technologies and renewable operations are kind of making waves in GCC countries tells you a lot about how Pakistan can benefit. I think first on the technical front, on how Pakistan can use this existing infrastructure to kind of uh, limit adverse exposures. So for example, when you talk about uh, you know carbon emissions and all of that, uh, there are best practices that are being discussed and will be discussed at the UN forums as well. Where does Pakistan fit in? Second, the loss and damages fund. Pakistan has owed a lot of reparations. Mm. Uh, in order to get those back and how to channel them is going to be a big step forward. So yes, this can also be used as a way to kind of see where Pakistan's climate priorities are, but if you get the funding in, then we can have a discussion going forward. Dr. Stan, uh, when we talk about government's uh, plan to attract both uh, domestic and foreign direct investments to stimulate uh, in, uh, economic growth, how do you see what are the steps that are needed uh, to attract these investments? Of course, you pointed out the bottlenecks earlier, but what steps are needed? Right. Uh, see, uh, Marim, we must have to think uh, the SAFC framework. The, worst, the most important part is that the domestic uh, export, uh, I mean, dimensions, we have to create all those things. And then we have to attack the foreign direct investment, which is about the, uh, uh, if we talk about the target is 100 billion. Uh, 100 billion. So SAFC is uh, consists of the three tiers, which is very much important. So one is the framework. Second is the focus area where I can, uh, I mean, uh, I'll talk about the defense, agriculture, minerals, information, technology, telecommunication, energy. And the most important thing is the way of the TORs. So TOR is important. It is not about the energy, how we can deal with the energy. We know the areas, but the, the technical bureaucratic areas are very much in problem, problem because it takes uh, much of the time to uh, initiate. Then is the APEC committee, which is very much important. And third is the state-owned enterprises, which is the biggest trouble on Pakistan, which is about 212 companies, uh, 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 state-owned enterprises, which yeah, give us uh, the, the the worsten part of the 2.7 uh, trillion of the loss uh, every year, 2.7 of the trillion loss. And then it is just yield of the one person. So they have created the SIFC framework, which is about the six member apex committee chaired by the prime minister. Then his executive committee will have 18 member, eight member, and including representative from the uh, Pakistan army. And then his implementation committee will comprise, uh, uh, comprise five members from the both civilian and the military leadership. And then as a co-opted member will include the sector finance, which is very much important. So civil and military uh, combination. Then as a secretary of the board of investment, this need to be done. And this is very much important part. Then is the secretary of economic affair division. Economic uh, affair division was the most least interested part of our bureaucratic structure. They have. Uh, never been, uh, I mean, participated in the way it should be. Uh, uh, I don't want to go into details, but this SIFC plan is not about to create the basic, rather they are creating the, uh, I mean, the problematic area into the right directions. Then is the chairman of the Federal Board of Revenue and then deputy governor and the provincial person. So focal area, as I told you earlier in this area, that the, according to the terms of the reference, the council will develop long-term plan in the relevant field while capitalizing on the low-hanging fruit. So growth and development, investment, and to monitor the progress of the each sector division, uh, division the Apex Committee, Executive Committee, and Implementation right. Committee will hold the quarterly, monthly, and fortnightly meetings. Uh, so, Brigadier Hamid, when we talk about this economic revival plan, uh, quickly tell us uh, how do you see the future potential of this uh, economic revival plan and specifically uh, this special investment facilitation council uh, for the future of Pakistan's economy? Uh, I would start with the how it is going to affect the common man hmm. because that is the basic question of course. which has not been addressed in the past also. I think uh, by constituting this council, first is the honesty and the interest shown by the federal government 
and including army net they also want that it should be a permanent feature for next 3 to 4 years so that all the objective which has been set by the government are achieved in a pragmatic way now what would be the effect on first of all is the job opportunities we have a youth world 30% of our 30 years plus is two third of our majority and i am happy today hanan is with us who represent that segment of our society it is very vibrant very talented of but there are no opportunities hmm. so this council is going to give them the opportunities give them the environment so that they excel and they also make Pakistan progress in the right direction. Of course. Apart from the job opportunities, what we look at, it is going to reduce pressure on our for a exchequer because of which we will have better exchange rate that at present we have dollar exchange rate about 280 plus 287 and, and uh, hopefully after three, four years, what I see that it is going to drop to 100 or less than 100 because we will be self-reliant, self-sufficient. And uh, being a nuclear country, I think it's our right also that we have a strong economy with self-reliance on our own resources. And third step, which is going to less inflation, because uh, Pakistan is a not that rich country, poor country, if we say in terms of uh, per capita income. So there will be less burden of livelihood on our population, which is going to basically ease them a lot of difficulties. So these are few of the tangible I'm not talking of intangible, of but course. because of the tangible effects which a common man can have. Of course. Thank you very much, Brigadier Hamid Rashid, for joining us in today's Thank program. Much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hanan Hussain, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan Javed, for joining us in today's program. In today's program, we talked about Pakistan's economic revival plan, which will be implemented by Special Investment Facilitation Council. And of course, there are a number of sectors that hold uh, untapped potential when we talk about Pakistan's economy, but agriculture, IT, telecommunication, uh, energy, as well as defense production have been pointed out when we talk about this uh, economic revival plan. Uh, and of course, uh, this economic uh, revival plan needs uh, uh, the, all the stakeholders to come on board and like we talked about in this program that this vision can be turned into a tangible reality uh, if we focus on these key areas. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.